Hi friends, it's Annie Grace and I am the author of This Naked Mind and I'm answering questions. And today I have a question from, from Jack. But before that, I had a question about that fish right there. Um, people were wondering, what's the deal with the fish? That is a fish that my dad caught when he was 15 on a deep sea fishing trip with lots of lots of guys. And the um, he was the only one on the whole three day trip to catch a fish on this big, big, you know, trip so he was very excited and I now have it framed in my office or stuffed or whatever that is but in any case that's the deal with the fish but on today's question uh, the question is uh, from Jack and he says I am trying to moderate and I'm being pretty successful and only drinking a few times a month so far I feel really proud of myself but then why Annie do I feel so bad mentally physically etc the day after is this the, the dynorphin you talk about and so yeah I think you know we talk a lot about not drinking at all but I think that a lot of people need to go through this journey of moderation and for some people it ends up working I mean I don't I don't um, personally drink for all sorts of reasons that you can listen to other videos on but you know the journey through moderation we're trying to answer the big question can I still do this on occasion and more importantly if I can do I actually want to so I think you know in Jack's situation Jack you've you've kind of seen the cost of drinking overall and so your question is is there a place for this is there a time when the benefits of drinking are going to outweigh the costs and for some of us, we might immediately just answer no. I don't want to get stuck there again. It's not going to outweigh the cost. But for others of us, we need to answer that question by trying out moderation. And I'm a firm believer that before you try moderation, you need a bit of a break from alcohol. Um, the guys over at One Year No Beer, they do these two challenges, a 30-day break or a 90-day break. And I think you can't, a lot of what happens when you drink because alcohol takes 10 days to leave your body is that you're actually like similar to when you're smoking a cigarette the craving for the next cigarette is the nicotine leaving your body a lot of the craving for the next drink or even that little niggling feeling I want to drink or drink sounds good is actually the craving from the drink you had last night so you know 10 hours later you wake up the next morning you know about 3 p.m. 4 p.m. 5 p.m. you want to drink a lot of that is just a physical addiction from the alcohol and everything leaving your body. So I think you need to put some distance between yourself and that before you try to moderate because that feeling of relieving that craving, it's like scratching an itch. You know, scratching an itch is pleasurable, but you would never purposely get itchy just to scratch it. So you need to like eliminate the itch. And then when you do that, you can make you know, a much more conscious decision about every drink saying, okay, is this actually doing anything for me once I know that I'm not truly craving it in a any sort of physical perspective um, and so I think that you know the journey to moderation you're trying to find your sweet spot and I define personally the sweet spot as a place of mental freedom no regrets just peace and no harm to your life so um, I like to talk about uh, a guy Kenneth Anderson and he's a foundation of harm reduction for alcohol and he his sweet spot is that he drinks unlimited amount every Friday night and then he doesn't drink throughout the week he never drives he reduces all harm um, you know aside from just his physical body and that's where he has found that he is at peace and happy about it and he's been doing this since 2002 and you know for him allowing himself that at Friday night is is where it is for him and the alternative for him would probably be drinking more because you know his his desire and his cravings for alcohol are not something that he was just able to let go of and so I think that finding your sweet spot it takes effort and it takes work and it takes effort because you can no longer just mindlessly drink when you're trying to moderate by definition you're trying you're thinking about it so you know specifically to um, Jack's question the day after can be pretty intense because of all that mental effort you're sort of putting into analyzing what happened how much did you drink how was it was it really that fun did I drink too much what did I say like there's it's not become some just sort of off-the-cuff thing you're doing anymore you're making this intentional decision to try and see where alcohol fits in in your life and that by definition it's work it's effort um, I think that you know in order to really find success on this path no matter where you end up 
Being fully present and conscious in your decisions is absolutely key. Making a commitment to yourself that no matter what, you will heal from where you are coming from. So you're watching this video because you're coming from somewhere that you didn't like to be. You know, I didn't like my life. I didn't like my mind. I didn't like myself at the place I was when I was just drinking a lot repeatedly and I wasn't, didn't feel in control. I didn't feel like I could stop when I wanted to stop. I didn't feel good about taking days off. Um, I wasn't really able to take days off. It, it was totally painful for me and I felt completely deprived. I felt like alcohol was taking more than it was giving. So I made a commitment that I was going to change that. And if changing that ended up being that I could moderate, fine, but that wasn't what it was for me. Changing that ended up being that I don't drink at all anymore. But by making a commitment that no matter what, you're not going to go back to that place you were that you didn't like, you're going to go a long way. And even that commitment needs to, needs to mean, though, that if you're not going to go back, you're willing to stop altogether if you can't find a place of peace and mental happiness and rest in moderation you need to commit at some level that this journey through moderation is to find an answer and you need to accept the fact that that answer may be that you're an alcohol-free person, that you're not a drinker. And I think, you know, that commitment can go a long ways towards your, your motivation in moderation. Um, Gretchen Rubin, she says that there's two types of people, moderators and abstainers, you know, and she calls herself an abstainer and she says, you know, it's much easier for her. She loves this certain type of um, of frozen yogurt and it's much easier for her to never have it than to have it twice a week because if she has it twice a week she wants it absolutely every single day so you know I definitely feel like I'm probably more of an abstainer I can give something up easier than I can moderate but I think even if you're naturally a moderator you need to realize that when you're dealing with an addictive substance and it's mind altering, moderating does become a lot, a lot of work. So, so Jack's specific question, and that was a bit of a tangent, but I thought I'd just talk about that path through moderation a little bit. But the specific question is why then, these few times a month that he drinks, does he feel so terrible the day after? And is it the dynorphin? And we'll talk about the dynorphin, but first I just think it's, it's mental. I mean, mental exhaustion, you know? You've made this mental inventory of your evening when you're drinking. How was it? What was it? Who was it? What happened? What did I learn? Um, and this process just spins and spins and, and it's exhausting. And um, our brains are worrying and worrying on the pros and cons of that decision to drink. And so we're trying to just deconstruct our motivation. You know, we're trying to be honest with ourselves about our cravings. We're trying to maintain control over something that inherently, you know, is addictive and isn't that easy to control. And we're trying to decide if we're making the choices we want and that we feel good about, or if we're making just impulsive choices made with our lower brains, made with the part of ourselves that just is entertaining that craving um, rather than, you know, making the long-term choices that we want to be making. And um, I think another thing that's important to be mindful of is that, you know, often we drink to be social and to connect with others and to really engage with other people. Um, but what a lot of us notice is that when the drinking becomes more important than the people near the end of it, we actually, drinking becomes a really lonely thing. I mean, at the end of my drinking, most of my drinking was done by myself in my hotel room. and that's not that's not connecting with anybody that's me and you know my ipad watching some tv shows and my bottle of wine and like i think that happens when drinking comes to a place of being more important than those connections so you do start off drinking for those connections but then drinking becomes something that often we do alone when we're really realizing that it's taking more than it's giving so i guess in my answer to to jack i would be really conscious of is that time of drinking that once or twice a month, did it actually connect you to people? Or was it something where you just wanted to get more alcohol down the hatch and you just, you know, even to this point, we're like, okay, tonight's my night to drink. Yeah, I'll drink a few here, but I'd rather just go home because then I don't have to worry about how I'm acting. So are you actually being closer to people or further away? Because often if you wake up and you had a great night the night before really truly connecting with people, you feel pretty good about it. But if you had a night before where actually the alcohol created distance and you realize it created distance um, and your memories are fuzzy, et cetera, you might not feel so good about it. And then of course there's the physical the physical aspect of why you could feel so bad the day after. Um, dehydration, I mean, that's just huge, you know, like, 
you just get dehydrated when you drink. It causes hangovers. It causes you to feel miserable. Um, the purging process, your body is actually turning the chemical of alcohol into other chemicals in order to process it. So one is acetaldehyde. And acetaldehyde is actually more toxic, especially to your brain, than alcohol. And it is a byproduct of your body breaking down the alcohol. So that that chemical itself is the reason that alcohol is linked to more than 20,000 can, cancer deaths annually in the States is that acetaldehyde. And that's what happens. That's how your body purges itself of alcohol. And unfortunately, when you are drinking every night, um, your body creates an immunity. It creates more efficient systems to deal with and purge that acetaldehyde from your body. When you are drinking twice a month, you don't have that immunity. Your body isn't protecting itself. It isn't one of its primary functions. It's doing lots of other important, beautiful things, but it no longer has this primary immunity or tolerance to alcohol, and it isn't as efficient in getting it out of your body. So, you know, moderating, I guess it's a very horrible thing to say that an immunity to a poison is a benefit, but if you are drinking every night, you're not going to feel that purging process like you would feel it if you're drinking twice a month. Now, that is a horrible reason to drink every night because cumulatively, your health, of course, is much, much worse. Um, and then just being out of your senses, you know, losing kind of your capacity to m remember things and just not being as present, I think, takes a little time to readjust to that. Um, and then I think the dynorphin is really, really a factor here. And I noticed this. So dynorphin happens because it is a natural painkiller and it's a natural anti-stimulant. So if alcohol kind of stimulates unnaturally your pleasure centers in your brain, dynorphin actually counteracts that. And after you've been drinking for a long time, you know, dynorphin can flood your system the day you drink because, you know, dopamine floods your system and then dynorphin can flood your system. And I, you know, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I have read lots about this and, and dynorphin just makes you feel distant and it makes you feel depressed. And, um, and yeah, it will be present after you drink. And so I think that's another reason. But Jack, I think it's wonderful that you're going through this process. I think that, you know, the most important question to ask is, yeah, a lot of people find that they can moderate. They can just drink twice a, a month and they can make rules about it and, and they can do it. The question to ask is, do you want to and is it truly worth it at the end of the day for you? Um, or do you just want to find freedom by making that one completely freeing decision of, of letting it go? But of course, that's an individual question and everybody's path is completely unique. And um, as long as you're going forward to find your truth and to find your healing, and as long as you're making yourself the commitment to moving forward, you know, the only way that you fail is if you stop trying. Trying, no matter what you're trying, is succeeding. So anyway, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Jack, for the question. And again, this is Annie Grace, author of This Naked Mind.